As Dr. Rodriguez said, I'm pastor of the Buena Vista Methodist Church in Alameda. Uh, we're founded in 1898, serving Japanese immigrants at the turn of the century. And uh, I had the privilege of meeting the filmmaker, Conrad Adiger. Um, I can't remember the exact date, but it had to be around 2006 or 2007 or so. And actually, he was in the process of, um, of making the film. Um, and I met him because I was working with Palestinian folks in the Bay Area. I think it must have been about 2008. We were doing a, uh, an event around the Gaza incursions, and the, and the killings that happened in 2008 with the Gazans. And there was a man who was there from Palestine and told him, you need to meet this Japanese American in New York who's doing a film. And he gave me his name. And I happened to just be flying to New York that night. And so we connected in New York had breakfast with him. He told me that he needed to get more money to finish his film. And so I said, we'll come out to the West Coast, we'll host a film showing for you, and then we'll start to do some fundraising for you. And we did that. And what we did was we brought together an audience that was a pan-Asian and multi-ethnic audience to show the screening of the film and get a first pass on it, give him some feedback, and then we started some fundraising activities so that he could finish, uh, finish his film. And it was a real privilege to meet him because he is what I consider a fourth generation. I'm third generation Japanese American. Uh, I was born after the war time, after my parents and his grandmother were in the same camp. So you saw in the film uh, footage from Topaz, Utah. That's where my uh, father's side, my father grew up in uh, West Oakland. His grandfather had a small little corner restaurant. They lost their restaurant. They were uh, in turn first to and he had to the Palestinians and the Palestinian narrative story because our narrative had been shut down and suppressed for many, many years until we entered into the redress movement in the early 80s where we were able to tell our stories and it ultimately ended up uh, ending in 1988. The Civil Liberties Act of 1980 was passed, apologizing to Japanese Americans for what had taken place during World War, uh, World War II. Anyway, long story short, around that, um, Conrad was able to then, you know, get more funding for his film and finish it and begin to bring it and show it to Japanese American communities where he began making an intersection um, around the whole impact of the, uh, what was going on in the war on terrorism, what happened to uh, Farouk, you know, in terms of his being picked up right after 9-11 and the things that we were dealing with as Japanese American communities supporting uh, South Asians and Arabs who were being picked up, like left and right. We were out at rallies at INS and trying to support people and support families and communities where a lot of people were being picked up because similar thing happened to our communities. FBI during World War II, prior to uh, the mass incarceration, um, infiltration came to our communities. People were being picked up and interrogated, and then, then the mass incarceration took place. So there was something in our history that spoke to what was happening with post 9-11 um, and those people being picked up and deported after 9-11. But then also there was this connection for us with what was going on in Palestine, and the bigger picture of the Palestinian reality and how we need to do more education around that. And that, that was around the same time we met Conrad as he began to show the film. It helped us begin to educate our community on the parallels of suppressed history and uh, suppressed narratives and also the way media images were man manipulated. And I know that's very important for uh, Professor Tazani's class, uh, looking at images in the media and how they perpetuate stereotypes and also how they begin to form targeted communities, which happened to us, uh, Japanese American community, in, in our historical narrative, but also was happening in the post 9 11 era, but it's happened to Palestinians for time eternal. And so, this is something that we really need to look at how we work on that through the education, demystifying some of the things that we hear about the Palestinians. Uh, we do a lot of intersectional work in our congregation. As uh, Rita said, uh, we have uh, Central American Ministry right now. We're a sanctuary congregation. We work with uh, Central American refugees and have folks living at our space. Uh, we do work with Palestine. We do human rights work in the Philippines where people are getting targeted as terrorists there. Human rights activists there are being on a hit list. There's, there's a Methodist church members who have been killed because of their activism in helping to support um, the land rights of indigenous people there where mining interests are coming into certain areas of the country to try to take over. And in collusion with paramilitary who are targeting uh, activists, lawyers, students who are trying to support uh, people there. Uh, so there's, there's a widespread connection, I believe, between what we need to look at in terms of this ongoing 
war on terrorism, who, quote, the terrorists are, and the way terrorists supposedly get named and targeted um, in the name of the war on terrorism, when actually there's a lot going on in terms of targeting activists and targeting uh, human rights defenders uh, around the world. And it's not, you know, so there's a lot of intersection that we need to do. And I think I'm going to stop there. And there's a lot more I can say, but so we want to we open it up for that. I've got some handouts here uh, that will help me cut my stuff short too, so we can get into the discussion. But you know what's really good around this film is it's trying to um, draw, uh, help draw the parallels and lessons from stuff that's happened in the past to what's going on today. So I think um, one of the professors they opened up to say how. Um, this time of year, uh, especially for Japanese American community, is the day of remembrance, where we take time to remember what happened to our community during World War II, commemorate those um, that happened, but also recommit ourselves to the sense of we don't want this to happen again to other people. You know, and so in that, um, I guess what I wanted to share is is that. For us to say that we don't want things to happen again to other communities, it's like we really got to know what happened in the past so that we can try to make those parallels and lessons. And so um, what's going on with the Japanese American community and our narrative around um, you know, incarceration is uh, the Society has come to recognize it a lot because of what the Japanese American community was able to see your head in terms of our um, struggle for redress. But the narrative, I think when you start um, uh, peeling back the layers of the history, you notice that it isn't complete. In fact, there's a lot missing. And then we begin to raise the question of, well, what's missing? Why is it missing? Whose interest does it serve? That there are certain parts of things that get elevated and give you voice to, and others don't. So then, what I want to share is a, a little bit more background on some of the history that maybe um, can add to information that we got through the movie as well. Because during World War II, it's true that you know the Japanese American community was under severe attack, leading to the incarceration. You know, with the executive order 9066. But what people don't realize is there were other people interned there. There was a whole other set of camps that people don't know about and detention facilities, numbering over 50. And you go, well, who was in those camps? And how come we don't know about it? So when a Pearl Harbor attack happened, right away the government started disappearing people. And it wasn't just from the Japanese American people. It was also the German community and the Italian community. And it wasn't just in the United States. It was in Latin America, too. So what we're seeing is, is that if we had a broader picture of what was really going on in the United States, that there was more happening besides the internment of Japanese Americans, then we'll see uh, massive civil and human rights violations uh, across the two continents with people that are uh, targeted as the enemy. So what we saw was right after Pearl Harbor, people are getting picked up, and they're basically immigrants, immigrant leaders of our communities, in uh, the German-American community, Italian-American community, Japanese-American community. They're disappearing. And uh, there's a, you might uh, be interested, there's a, actually an enemy alien act 1980, 18, that authorizes the president um, to pick up folks that are 14 years and older who are members of the, uh, the enemy countries and able to apprehend them and detain them. So this is law, and that's what was invoked during World War II, and it's still good law. And so then what happened was uh, you had people being put into these other set of camps that, unfortunately, people don't know much about. But then what, what was really the twisted thing about it, because, you know, this country is so deep in racism, what happened with the Japanese Americans 
was the, um, the confinement, the detention, the enemy classification that's then applied to the uh, U.S. citizens as well, because in the racist minds, you can't tell a Jap from a Jap. It doesn't matter what their citizen's status is. You know? And that's where you have the particularity of the Japanese American incarceration that shouldn't be lost. That you can have your cats happening on the immigrants, but it's going to spread to the citizens. So what's going on in our country is really important now, because precedent has been set years and uh, decades and decades that um, the most vulnerable sector can get a cap. They, you let their uh, civil and human rights be abrogated. It's it going to be long before maybe citizens' rights are also going to be affected. Mm -hmm. So then what we saw was that happening in the United States. But then the United States goes to Latin America and starts a rendition program there, kidnapping men, women, and children of German, Italian, Japanese, and some Jewish people too, kidnapping them, uh, transporting them over international borders, bringing them to the United States and putting them, them in this other set of camps. And what do they do? They use some of them for hostages to exchange them for U.S. citizens that are held in the Far East or in Europe. And the really bad thing is they got some Jewish people from Latin America too. Some of them who had been refugees from Europe who had fled, and they take them to the United States and turn them, and we, we learned that they actually sent some people back. You know? So then what we see is, okay, rendition doesn't didn't just happen, you know, Abu Ghraib and the, the revelation of those hidden sites. There's precedence years earlier, uh, also in World War II. You know, and so, what we see is the government um, has uh, not learned from its mistakes in the past, partly because it would, if you just stick to a narrow uh, version of what happened during World War II, what was World War II in turn, if you just keep it to the Japanese American experience narrowly, then you miss this whole other part of history that we really have to look at if we really want to look at. I just want to add uh, three things because I want to do, do all the talking. People listen to me talking all the time. But I've, you know, done a lot of studying, uh, you know, my focus is on the media and uh, news reporting and uh, documenting and archiving all the different news reports from the minutes after 9-11 and how Basically, our media kind of took the government's line and started in this unification process or the presentation of the other. And I'm sure you all remember how across the world, all news, news networks, they were flying the American flag in the corner of, the, of their screens. They were presenting and vilifying, you know, Arabs, Muslims, and then we had the different codes, you know, code red, yellow, green, to create this chaos and fear. And, and through this documentation process that I was going through, and I wanted to, to actually dig around and see if there was something else, like a parallel in our history. And it led me quickly to the Japanese internment yeah. period. So all I had to do is go through all the archives and go to the old news reels, and the same thing happened. You know, the same thing happened. You know, we didn't have as many news networks, we didn't have satellite TV, and so forth. But in the old news reels, the same way, the same way they were addressing this issue, painting the Japanese American, conspiring with the imperial powers, mm -hmm. even the pictures, the cartoons. The narratives, they started chipping away at the average American mind to suspect their neighbor. It's the same method. And it's very easy really to compare and contrast, and that's that's something I think is very important, not just the government, but also our media. I remember um, one of the first newscasts I saw right after 9 11, it showed Palestinians dancing in the street, right. and the newscast said the Palestinians would take the credit for the World Trade Center bombings 
Then they retracted that two days later because they had taken the file film from their files and then put it out there like that. But they had already cast that narrative. Right? Yeah. By, the, by the time they had retracted it, not everybody saw the retraction. So at this point, perhaps we can open up to questions and comments from folks who are here in the crowd. You know, if anyone feels has uh, some comments or questions like to, to the research. So I always kind of wondered that about World War II. With like, I knew Japanese internment have always wondered about like none of the Italians or the Germans were interned. I've heard about other little weird things that went on, but how many? Do you have like a per capita? Like a, how many? that were American citizens were turned as compared to Japanese, kind of like how the prison system is like skewed one way. But I would say, you know, when we're looking at EO 9066, mm -hmm. people just think, oh, that just applied to a Japanese American, to a Japanese ancestry. It applied to uh, Germans and Germans too. So all the um, enemy aliens, the immigrants, mm -hmm. are like on um, certain of those, those military or um, restricted zones, they have to be evacuated or expelled is the better word from those areas. So right here, just because we're by the coast, all the fishermen, all the Italians, all the German uh, and German store owners uh, of a uh, certain uh, designated state uh, part of land had to move there, so you split up families and all like that. Um, I know more the Latin American side of it, but um, but the one figure that I do have is that of the people that was uh, interned in those other set of camps, there's about 31,000, and of those, 6,000 or so are from Latin America. So, um, but then, the, even though there's that 30,000, it go, in the United States, it, go, uh, it reaches near, nearly a, a million people because uh, they may not have been picked up for detention, but their whole community is scared. And all the citizens are scared, are we going to be taken too? Are we, you know, because they see the Japanese Americans being taken away. So the whole effect is to um, instill fear in communities. And so they don't speak up. They try to keep their head down. You know? The thing I wanted to mention about um, the Japanese American redress and then building on what, what um, race is still doing today. So in, in 1988, Civil Liberties Act 1980 was passed on August 10th. So that was passed by Congress apologizing to Japanese Americans. And then two years later, people got checks in the mail for redress and then also letters of apology. But the commission stated uh, that um, after after there was a commission hearings across the country, San Francisco was one of the locations where Japanese Americans were able to come and tell their stories. Okay, and then um, and some of us were able to be involved in organizing people to come out and share their stories. Philadelphia, New York, LA, other cities. Then that was in 81. But by, by 88, they had done their documentation. And then uh, their conclusion was that this had taken place because of pre-existing racial prejudice, um, lack of political leadership, and quote, wartime hysteria. So that the, the hysteria of being at war clouded people's thinking. So these are things that we continue to evoke today. That when we think about quote, the war on terrorism that has now gone on since 2001, there's still this cloudiness of what the heck this war is all about. But there definitely has to be an enemy. And this is where media comes in. Media has to, media and war makers have to create an enemy. You have to create the face of the enemy. And so some of you know what that's like because you're the face of the enemy. Our community knew what that was like because we were the face of the enemy at that time. And we have to be very careful about how that's all being projected and manipulated because that creates the whole cloud and the shadow of everything. And then we have to call our politicians into accountability. And that's why we've been there to speak out for our communities and for South Asians. And then as Grace continues her work to say that what happened for Japanese American redress didn't tell the whole story because there were much broader stories that need to be told as well. And we continue to invoke that and say that for all of you, the Civil Leaders Act of 1988 is not just for us Japanese Americans, but it's for you too. So you can invoke that when you speak to different communities about what you see taking place and say that, hey, here's some principles we need to, to work with and abide by. 
Um, um, yeah, I just, um, when you had said parallels of suppressed histories earlier, um, could Nazi Germany exterminate the Jewish? Could that be another parallel? Well, I think anytime people are oppressed and people's stories are oppressed, mm -hmm. and so, you know, for me as Japanese American, there's a point in time where we were doing a lot of work with Jewish communities, particularly to see how our communities were traumatized, you know, in terms of post post uh, post traumatic stress and trauma and also the inability to have our story be told and we worked a lot with jewish communities about them being able to tell the stories of the holocaust and that's also what got us into working with palestinians because we could see in visiting palestine that their history was being suppressed because the narrative was always told by somebody else and so that's why for us our, the importance of us telling our own stories in our own um the redress hearings um, has led us to be strong advocates for the, the spaces where Palestinians can tell their own stories about their own history from their vantage point and to be able to educate people on the truths that we haven't heard. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add something on the, uh, the redress stuff. Because one of the things that I think when we do uh, try to share the story, and we really rely on everybody here to share the story. Um, is we can't just talk about the violations, you know, like the victim part of it. We need to talk about the redress stuff, which is the fight back and the defense of our constitution and stuff like that. And the Civil Liberties Act is a major accomplishment. I mean, there's not very many groups in, in the, this nation's history that have gotten, you know, uh, an apology from the United States for their uh, really bad violations of our Constitution, okay? That being said, um, I think now's the time that we need to really look at not only the internment history and you know, learn more about what happened, but we've got to look at that redress part. Because as the attacks are coming down, everyone's busy trying to defend ourselves. But somebody's got to say, hey, there's no government of impunity. Somebody's got to be held accountable for these civil and human rights violations. There's got to be a stop to the government doing these things when they've already apologized in the past. What's going on, you know? And that makes, uh, especially for us in the Japanese American community, say, uh, what does the apology mean? You know, because part of the uh, apology was so that uh, the United States could be stronger in the world community. Uh, when it made criticisms of other countries that did human rights violations, because they could say, hey, look, we apologize. We have a moral authority to criticize other countries and demand also that other countries be accountable. But what are we, what are we saying when the con conditions, but also the laws that led to our internment and our violations are still okay? Internment is still legal. They haven't, the Supreme Court hasn't overturned it, you know? As a rendition, you have um, Trump. He's going to be, he's taken um, proposals around doing the uh, secret spy networks that can carry out assassinations and all that. And then also the rendition program. He's not closing down Guantanamo. And we know that those black sites still exist. So the whole idea of the torture and uh, interrogation and stuff, I don't, I don't think we can assume that it's not happening or that it won't happen. And then when we see what's happening against immigrant activists getting targeted for their activism, then we should take heed on what that means in terms of people who are trying to stand up and defend our rights. So, well, also, also, like the Patriot Act, Patriot Act one and two. And many, many Americans actually don't know how much it fits into their constitutional rights. It's right there on the books. Uh, it was launched during the Bush administration, but even when Obama was, people were hopeful that he was going to do something about it. He did the opposite. He renewed it, extended it. So this is an important lesson of the Israelites. Like, I think all the time. Well, that's happening to that community. That's happening to those folks. One thing we're sharing on that is that, like, when they when they attack one of us, actually establishes a, a pattern that allows them to set up law and tools for them to attack more of us, right? 
so that we're all we were all affected against it. And I'm, I also appreciate what you're saying that that one group was able to win that. Um, that also opens up the door for other folks to say, hey, you deserve these things too. To be uh, in solidarity. Um, hi. So I was watching the film and I was trying to mirror a lot of the past into the present and future. I was making so many connections with detainment um, camps and centers. And I think my question is, as the future approaches and with the takedown of DACA and like my family is undocumented and I'm not good at politics, I want to know how to like, contact a lawyer, any of that. What are you, some of your guys' like, advices or resources when it comes to how do we take care of our own families, our own communities in face of being deported, in the face of like really not knowing where they're going to go or what's going to happen to them? We do, uh, we have an immigration ministry at our church and we have a coalition of different congregations, so a couple of families, and also part of the coalition so that we do policy work at, at the state level. And then we have a national immigration task force also in the Methodist Church. What I would suggest is that there's immediate situation for your family mm -hmm. that you have to be attentive to, but try not to be isolated mm -hmm. and try to network with other families and get involved with organizations that are supporting families and providing information and be active, be active with as best you can. I think a lot of families are very vulnerable because of the documentation situation. People don't want it to be too visible. Mm -hmm. um, we've had ICE come to our congregation already because we've had a family member come to Guatemala and they came through a detention center uh, but they were able to come because we have family members living in California that came from Arizona. But they had to have an agreement with ICE that she would have um, uh, what do you call ankle braces on, and that ICE would visit every once in a while. So we're, we're kind of having to deal with uh, the juxtaposition of trying to keep ICE away, but trying to comply with things so she can be safe. And they, they've applied for amnesty, and then the cases in process. But there's so many different kind of cases and situations. So we definitely try not to be isolated. I think that's the first first thing, and then where you can uh, be with people who are active and speaking out. Because unless we speak out, things are not going to change. And, and you know, DACA stuck right now in Congress, so you know there's a lot of people that are in limbo with that. Sounds like a great family. Sorry, going off that. Do you, do you guys see maybe a kind of mirroring of like? Would we be in a situation where a lot of this stuff is like rehappening, where people are being held in? detainment centers, and I mean, I don't know how many people are, are under DACA, but it's like like thousands of people. I don't ex know how they expect to deport those people so quick. And I remember in the film, I didn't know this, there was a law that says um, you can't hold a detainee for more than six months if you're not going to deport, net, deport them. I'm not sure if that law still stands, but I mean, is that even possible with the thousands of people they're expecting to hold in centers? Well, I think from our, anecdotally, from our national task force for our Methodist Church of Immigration, people are, are being deported and have been deported. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when the next thing we know, something you knew is gone. And so it's, it's taking place. And so people are trying to prevent that. What Sanctuary Movement is about is us providing space for people who are under threat of deportation and providing them safe space for them to be protected. And so. That's where we and many other congregations are trying to be sanctuary. So if there are people in our network who need sanctuary, we're saying, you, know, you come here. And we'll try to protect you from, from ICE agents coming in to deport you. Um, there's one other thing I want to mention, you know, that struck me in this film, because the film goes back to this, the beginning of the Department of Homeland Security, right? And you heard the Department of Homeland Security referred to several times, and he was trying to interview people there. Think about this. Since 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security has become the institutionalized branch of the war on terrorism. Okay, and we've, we now not only have military industrial complex, but we have what's called security industrial complex. A lot of money is going into the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security is where we have the immigration uh, work that's being done. You know, the Border Patrol, the, what do you call it, increased numbers of people on the border are being funded through the Department of Homeland Security. And then you hear about the wall that's being proposed, and that's being, the political thing is being traded, we don't want to trade to build a wall, pass a DACA a bill, right? But it was already, through the Department of Homeland Security, last August, uh, approval of four vendors to build concrete uh, prototypes of the wall. And they got 300 million each. They were vendors in Arizona, 
Texas, Alabama, Mississippi. So what's going on there is there are vendors who are being rewarded for their support of the administration, getting contracts. It's so $1.2 billion that was allocated by the Department of Homeland Security last August. Okay, and those are the prototypes that are being looked at for the building of the big wall that will cost like $20 billion. And where is the wall being, where's the model of the wall being fabricated from? From Palestine. If you have anybody been to Palestine, you see the big wall there, 28 foot high wall, concrete wall. And, and so this is all part of an economic industry for post security building and the security industry that we, security culture that we're now kind of engulfed in. You know? And we experience it anytime you go to an airport, anytime you go anywhere, you have to kind of go through a checkpoint. Um, obviously, the fear mongering that occurred after the events of 9 11, you know, indirectly or directly, created a lot of pushback against activism against the state. Um, I was wondering if you see any parallels happening now with regards to the issue of Russia. Um, in the last few months, there's been an effort to, you know, silence and smear activism online, which are political figures, and even like independent media on YouTube. Um, in the name of having Russian meddling, Russian bots, and Russian immigrants. And so I was wondering if you have some of the Well, I'll speak to you again. Well, I mean, I think, I think the thing we have to understand, too, when we're talking about war, again, war is to, necessitates an enemy. And then you have to create the face of the enemy. Okay, so there's a lot of, a lot of stuff moving around right now, particularly from our administration, creating this you know, again, this sort of cloud of a war on terrorism, or the cloud of this war against people who are out to get us. And, and essential to that is creating fear. You have to create fear of an enemy that's out there. And then that's going on with uh, Korea right now, North Korea. So you talk to people in the Korean community, I don't know if there's any Koreans here in the room here, but you know, we have, we work with Koreans who are looking at uh, reunification of North and South Korea, not demonization of North Korea, but reunification of families who are there. And so um, we talk about what's going on with the, the military pivot from the Middle East, where uh, Colonel Ann Wright has talked about the goal has been to destabilize the Middle East, and now that the goal has been established, now we're turning to Asia. We call it the Asia pivot. Asia pivot, uh, Korea, the bad missiles base being done in Korea, and then also uh, the remilitarization of Japan, increased uh, military expenditures in the Philippines, targeting activists there. The Russia thing is, is another piece to all of this because um, if this administration wants to kind of pull a tight rein on things, you create enemies. And you create fear, and you create this sort of chaos out there where you draw on that fear to kind of tighten in your control of what, what, you wanna, what you wanna get done and who your constituency is. War is politics. In terms of the Russia thing, it's like, um, just to recall that it wasn't so long ago that Russia was also, and the Soviet Union was our enemy before. So I think that there's a connection there of trying to create the enemy, but it's kind of like a familiar enemy, an older enemy. And then um, I guess what I'm concerned about is when is it, that's going to be turned to uh, an anti-communism again. You know, so and using... Um, the idea of like foreign powers are coming to um, invade, whether it's through the elections or hacking or whatever. And um, you know, what does that mean to try and then um, attach that sense of foreignness or enemyness to the people that live in this country, like they did? And there's precedence for how that happened you know, in terms of the Macarthur scare, the Red Scare. So there's a lot of lessons from those past that we I wanted to share some comments too about the Russian issue in terms of Palestinian election. I think one of my concerns with that is that I think it deflects attention from like actual plans within the United States to limit democracy, particularly like Chris Kobach, um, someone who's been working to restrict the vote in the United States. You know? So I think we lose sight of, of what's going on within the United States to reduce how many people can vote, specifically who can come out to vote. At the same time, we're not looking at money in politics, right? So I think it's one of the ways that it, it reflects our attention. It creates an enemy, and then it gives us, as, as I'm learning, you know, it creates an enemy, it directs an 
democracy towards them, state power, and that creates uh, business opportunities for people to sell. Um, things necessary to do that, and also deflects attention away from the real, I guess, the termites within the news within the building that we're living in. So, this gentleman has a Oh, just what you were saying about the whole calling and spread scare thing. It's, but, I mean, Air, America is so heavily more invested now with the, the Saudi Arabia. With all the oil money that's been invested in the United States, like Bitcoin, and then China that's doing the same thing with the data mining, and also only like 40% of downtown San Francisco, like with property and buildings. I mean, how is the U.S. really safe from foreign investment and foreign interference in politics? Mm -hmm. It's already ingrained in our society. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I think on one level, too, it's like, well, there's different investments. And there's different businesses happening, ventures and stuff, but that, that doesn't always equate to invasion by a foreign government or power or a Well, I know, but you know, I mean, the U.S. is also supposed to be in the deal right now making a new reactor for Saudi Arabia, too. Mm -hmm. That's like just came out, I think, earlier today. I remember hearing it, and I'm like, well, that's, you know, pretty big because the whole thing that when we pull out the our proliferation agreement with North Korea, when we were helping them with the reactors, and then they kind of start saying, well, we want this, we start saying no. And then all this now with all that, with Saudi Arabia, I don't know, it just seems like, are we really safe from foreign threats in our political system? So when you're also, are we safe from people who want to make money off of the war? No. Yeah. Yeah. Touche. <laughs> I think the other question we have to ask ourselves too is where, what is the uh, intersection of national interests and global money interests? And sometimes global money interests are pushing agendas in national politics, not only for our country, but in other countries as well. So, for example, does this current administration have the interests of the nation most at stake or money interests, which, which are global, not national? I think also uh, the politics of fear is very much ingrained in every administration, but whenever you have a Republican at least administration in the past eight, 12, and so forth, how many years ago, let's say, let's say we go back to 9-11, this has been part and parcel of their political campaign or election campaign. Yeah. So as long as you have, you create an enemy, and this is what, that's why I go back to the Bush administration, when, you know, they focused basically for eight years creating this fear from Muslims, from Arabs, from people of color, uh, creating a, a whole coding system, you know, we used to hear about, we don't hear about that all of a sudden now. Remember, we, we used to go to the airport, you have to check, oh, today is yellow, to the, the, the red, whatever. All these alerts disappear, which tells you something that they were just manufactured and they were created. And I believe now during the Trump administration, they have similar plans or they started, you know, to go early on by making those declarations, Trump going on TV and saying the Muslim ban and naming countries, etc. Except things haven't played the way they planned for. Uh, and and this, there's something really scary going on. The recent attacks or the recent killings, Las Vegas, a couple of days ago, the school, you know, there is kind of a counter reaction, an organic counter reaction, because this is not what they planned for. They would have rather seen a crazy Muslim or a crazy brown guy or something like this shooting people. But all of a sudden now we have killings by ordinary white people or you Americans going, you know, the last famous, of course, we all term these people as deranged. Somehow the explanation for these acts, it's like, you know, you need a psychiatrist to talk about it. Think mm -hmm. about it every time. Las Vegas, all of we hear about this guy, this killer, whatever you want to call him, his mental status. Similarly, this young uh, 
uh, high school or high school, yeah, 19 year old, same thing, it's a mental issue. But imagine for one second if this person was an Arab American, the last year, or this person was a Muslim American, there'll be a whole different narrative, a whole different approach in the media, and then, of course, in the statements coming by the White House. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump wouldn't be talking about the, uh, what is it, the AR-15 or the, 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 the He would be talking about maybe deportation or more security, all, all these things. So that a little bit threw a monkey wrench in their plan. I believe this has, has thrown a monkey wrench. And, and for, uh, you know, Arab Americans, it's always been Muslim Americans, it's always been the fear when something like this happened, People will be thinking, hey, I hope it's not an Arab American, I hope it's not a Muslim American. Just for that reason, they created even a fear amongst our community that, just like any other community, whether you're an Arab American or an African American, Latino, etc., there are good people, there are bad people. So we have to take, but we have to take responsibility en masse for the act of, of let's say, one individual, while other communities, well, they can say, ah, he's deranged. The, should have been seeing this therapist. But race, in this regard, you're saying like race works in this way. If you're racially enfranchised, they pathologize that one person. Right. But if you're racially disenfranchised, they'll pathologize the entire right. I want to add to that too. I'm glad you brought that up because it's, it's like that's not what people are planning on. Mm -hmm. Because people want to take advantage of the continued demonization of groups of people. And Certain national identity and so forth. But some might call this the karmic blowback. Karmic in the sense that when we understand that, and Martin Luther King used to say that violence only begets more violence. And so the violence we're seeing from people, grassroots citizens who are just kind of doing this stuff, allows us to now have a stronger civic conversation about the violence and where are the roots of the violence. And what's not been discussed is the hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq who've been killed, decimated, that we never talk about in this country. And we've got whole, the whole thing about destabilization of the Middle East, to Yemen, to Syria, the lives have already been lost, we never talk about it. Because the media images and the stories are crafted in a certain way just to only see people as demonized enemies versus human beings who have been subjected and victimized by our policy, our military. And I think there's a there's a conversation that needs to happen in our in our public square about violence and the sources of violence and our perpetuation of violence through our military policies. You have a question. Oh, I just have one more comment. One more comment. Yet. Also, uh, I think that the internet is the world in its Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but I just want to get um, I did have a connection between the media narrative as well as the conception of nationalism. Um, and it was uh, coming out of the community by the film itself, the, the classrooms that we're in, and the, the dialogue that we've been attempting to spark. Um, I think we must remember that we are still in a different land. We are on our own land. Um, and I think that's how I want to close my comment. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. I just wanted to respond to your question of uh, the comment around uh, the vulnerability mm -hmm. and what to do. Um, I think that I just we talk so much after a lot of like, what do you mean? Or did you? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know? so yeah. it's kind of like, oh, they can do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they'll just order more buses to be built or something. You know? Yeah. And um, you know, the thing is, is like if we go to Latin America and we go to Cuba, they don't get ships, they don't get planes, mm -hmm. you know, they'll do it, they'll find something. The other thing is, is that I think everyone that's not in the United States is vulnerable. So when we're talking about naturalized citizens, uh, they're vulnerable too, because there's always the, somebody in the Congress that want to take away people's rights. And we already had people saying, well, what about the children who are born from undocumented people? 
we should be citizens, you know? So it's so what I think is is we all need to have an emergency action plan. Just like we have when there's an earthquake, mm -hmm. we need something like that. And uh, if we can do it community wide, neighborhood wide, that's great. You know, it's like like we're saying, is we just can't be isolated and um, people feel it's only their problem. Or to be afraid to reach out to their neighbors. All right, quick question. Just before we leave, I want to leave on a note. I was just curious, what gives you all hope? You know, what are the places, places, or moments in your situation? You know, y'all felt hope or redemption, um, the possibility to build, to build the world and deserve the movement. There's times and moments that, that kind of give you something to keep walking through. One of my good friends is uh, Pastor Bethlehem Palestine Christian Richie Rada. He's a young man always has a slogan that hope is what we do. So uh, by doing, we engender hope. Um, if, we, if we kind of just stir it around mentally in our mind, we get paralyzed. You know? So just keep doing And for me, it's keep doing based on what we've done. And uh, that, that there's a history and there's people that came before us, our ancestors, and we keep thanking them and we draw energy from the people who came before us. We did justice and we keep doing our best. I just say for myself, the, um, the people that have been working on the Palestinian issue have really given me hope. Especially, I, you know, you guys all know about the professor. But, uh, um, you know, uh, being invited to come to some of the teaching and the different updates that have been happening have been really inspiring. You know, to know that people have been under attack in your country. And you know what? You know, Spirit, you know, they're hanging in there, and it's like really, um, it makes me like that's what you me hope because I see not only in the in the light of you know oppressive oppression, people are willing to stand up, and then we're learning from each other of histories. So things like this is just that's what you hope. Well. Uh, Sadly, I, I look at those who came before us, I look, and those who were here before us, like the Native Americans, the African Americans, who, the Native Americans, of course, who endured uh, extermination, basically, and the African Americans who endured slavery, and, and others, and, and, and for me personally, as a Palestinian American, as a Muslim American, as an Arab American, I take all these identities and I look and I say, you know, our suffering is in tales to their suffering. So that's, that's what keeps us going. I look at it and say, it's nothing. <laughs> they went through slavery, they went through extermination. Whatever they do to us, it pales compared to that. We'll say right now, I appreciate seeing all y'all lean in and be motivated by questions about what are we going to do. So I think that's one thing that gives a lot of hope. So, uh, so nice. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I have to check, like, I am not just going to know a lot of kids, like, a lot of my kids are not uh, documented. Like, I know the answers, and it's like, my kids are like in middle school, so it's like, they're trying, they're moving on. I can't like, they're just like, what? And even as they grow, even if there are these stigmas, yeah.